Welcome back. You're watching The Front Row. Thank you for staying with us. We are talking about a back to school like no other, first of many, right amid a pandemic. How are we handling it? The guidelines put in place. How are we implementing them? How viable are they? A panel of experts I have here tonight, Professor Hen Helen Inyega, an education policy expert, Mr. Nicholas Mayo, chairperson of the Kenya Parents Association, and Honorable Omboko Milemba, uh, chairperson, Kupet, and member of parliament for Mohai. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen and lady. Uh, Mr. Omboko Milemba, you were saying something just before we cut you off on the funding question. You started by saying there's a 10% deficit, uh, which then begs the question, how will schools run, uh, given that the Cabinet Secretary has asked uh, these particular institutions not to send any child home uh, for lack of, of fees. Thank you. I hope you can now get me well. Yes, very, very well. Thank you. Yes. What I was saying is that first I must loud Magoha because uh, he came out to strongly encourage every parent to take their children to school. And uh, that's why, though we know him as a very assertive person, we see him use the word plead. I'm pleading with all heads not to send away the students. That was good of him. And that's what we are also telling our teachers, that uh, go to school and receive those children the way they are. Even if some girls come when uh, maybe they have challenges of even pregnancy, some come without uniform, some come they have whatever. They don't have a uniform, just accept them. But uh, we are doing this because as leaders we must begin again. And as we begin again, we must put sacrifices in place. But away from that, the challenge of funding will remain a big one in the schools because schools have been given only 20% instead of 30% of the funding in terms of capitation, and yet they have not been given any other money to just deal with COVID situation. I heard Professor, who spoke earlier, uh, sympathize with government, but the truth is that it's the business of government to run education. And uh, education is actually in our constitution. And uh, it's not only free for primary and uh, basic, but it's also compulsory. So money must be found to just deal with education, including the informal schools in the slums that you talked about. Government must come to Parliament and uh, ask for more funding to actually put in place things that are required in the school setup during this COVID period. That is the truth of the matter. And I think that this government and Kenya has that type of money. Look at the situation we had with the desks. All that money we took to desks should have been taken in a more serious area like the masks. And therefore, I think that uh, the funding must be given by the government. Other challenges we are facing in school would be the teachers, who the government must pay. Motivation. Remember, we asked the government to pay the BOM teachers some funding to, during the COVID period. Right. But they did not pay the ones of primary. They only paid the ones of secondary and left the primary ones. So that would be another challenge. We need motivation. And finally, we shall need also good insurance coverage for the teachers during this period. So um, you mentioned government prioritizing um, uh, some of the areas that need um, and quickly are that uh, funding. Uh, we're talking about 1.9 billion shillings that went into the procurement of uh, prototype desks. Uh, we also saw 2.1 billion shillings um, from what the government said going to building of additional uh, classrooms. And even in the budget 2020-2029 financial year, the ministry was allocated 497.5 billion shillings. Shillings. Um, so funding would likely not be a very big problem. Are you then saying it's an issue of prioritizing the more pressing areas, Mr. Milemba? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. That uh, the risk workers are shifting slowly, hoping that COVID numbers go down from the health sector to the education sector. And therefore, prioritization of funding must now be directed not only in the health, but also the education sector. That is exactly what I mean. And once that is done, 
then every learner in Kenya should be able to access education and we still support first reopening. All right, thank you. I want us to take a look at some of the thoughts. And Mr. Milamba, there's a question for you here, so I'll be coming back to you shortly. Let's take a look at um, some of the views from our viewers on Twitter before we go on. Um, seeing a question here by Tom Kim Barraza, who says, ask Honorable Milamba um, if there will be a risk allowance for teachers during this pandemic. What will happen to learners who will report without school fees? And what will happen to learners in private schools which have closed down? This specifically addressed uh, to Honorable Milemba. And in my inbox on, uh, on Twitter, Duncan Kochiawa says, to be sincere, there is poor preparation to uphold any emergencies in relation to COVID-19. The students themselves do not adhere to social distancing. Some schools are far in relation to water, rooms, and other infrastructure needed. Just a comment there from Duncan Kochiewo, who is joining us. Mr. Mlemba, back to you on that response on just taking care of the teachers, because in schools, they're now being viewed as the frontline workers. Are they prepared enough? Are we yeah. cushioning yeah. these teachers? Thank you. In fact, I like the term frontline workers. Mm. Currently now, the teachers are the frontline workers, and therefore, the first thing they require is good insurance uh, that will cover not only the other cases pre-existing, but also COVID and comprehensively so. So that we shall be asking from the employer as a union. Number two are those schools that, uh, students that go to school without fees. I want to treat the plea by the minister as a real plea. But with time, the schools cannot run without money. And where can we get this money from? Either one, the government itself must give enough capitation to schools, including extra, that is to deal specifically with COVID cases and COVID pandemic. Or this money must then come from parents. So as we send the students to school, we want to believe that this is just a beginning, but sooner or later, the government should provide money for capitation and fees will be required. So we are also asking our teachers that in the first week, second week, please don't chase the students away. Try to start going back to normalcy. There's the issue of risk allowance, which I was asked. Mm -hmm. And as we now become the frontline workers, we are moving to also ask our employer teacher service commission for this risk allowance. We have been asking it for the science teachers because of the work they do in the laboratories, but now we shall be asking for the entire teaching fraternity. And finally, there was something on, uh, on uh, the, 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 the schools The private schools that were closed down. Yes, yes. Very good, thank you. The private schools that were closed down. Now, we have two categories of schools that were closed down. Mm -hmm. One are the private schools that cannot go back. And some of them actually told us they are either now changed into rearing chicken, while others uh, cannot just take off. For these ones, we are asking the ministry to quickly take a catalog of these schools, take a catalog of the children who are in these schools, and spread them out in the other schools that are public that are actually on. This will be very important for the candidates for equality uh, in preparation of exams. Mm -hmm. The other category are the schools in uh, Palso, Budalangi, Kisumu, and Baringo, of course, where these schools are flooded. The government and the minister must ask for more funding in this sector, specifically to create, to create makeshift schools to accommodate these learners so, as that, so that they are not dis, uh, disadvantaged. All right, thank you. To you, Mr. Mayo, um, a lot of questions around the priority areas, 1.9 billion shillings uh, going into desks when some schools still don't have proper uh, water and sanitation infrastructure. Uh, would you then say you would understand um, parents' anxiety, especially in schools that have not put this into place? And um, your thoughts on how the government has uh, prioritized some of the areas to do massive funding on in the education sector? Uh, thank you, Andera. On uh, ministry support or government support to schools uh, is that for us parents, we thought priority would be social distance. And because of uh, its investment, because it needs a lot of investment 
If you take an example of a school like Maranda High School, which has 2,400 students with only 40 classes, for social distancing to be realized in that school, we need another Maranda school to be built, which is next to impossible because it will take maybe another five years or, or even more. So um, what I think the government did was to assist us with these desks so that we can create space. For example, we can say in Maranda we use uh, 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 our dining hall for, for, for learning. We also use uh, some temporary structures, and uh, I think it will be possible because it is cheap and faster, unlike uh, the permanent building that takes a lot of money. So I think uh, as parents also, we can also uh, meet at the school level, because we have a parent association at the school level, and see to it that uh, because every school has its own unique challenges. School A is not like school B. Like uh, um, a school, uh, this, this, this primary school called the Olympic, it has the biggest number of uh, students, in, I mean, peoples in, in the country. Uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you go to a, a school, my school in the Eldoret Hill School, for example, the challenge in Hill School is only um, in the dormitory because they have enough classes, they have enough water. So in every school has its own challenge. In, in, a, in a setup like Hill School, for example, I was talking with the head teacher, I told him, we can meet and ask the, the, the parents who live around to have those children be their scholars. If we have them to be their scholars, then we'll not have congestion in the dome. That is only for Hill School. When you go to Miranda, we need space. When you go to uh, my, my other school, Hills, I mean Nairobi school, where my son is, we have enough classes, but we don't have, um, uh, the dorms are, are fewer. So every, every other school has its own unique challenges. So I'm requesting the parents that we should be very close at this time of pandemic to the teachers, to the parents, the BOM and the PA in school so that all of us can see what we can do in that particular time at that particular place. Because a school in Shimbalatewa has its own unique challenges. A school in Kwale, a school in Wajia, a school in Turkana. Like now we have, we have our school in Baringo flooded. About uh, seven primary schools and four high schools totally flooded. Now our children will not, unless they, they'll be transferred elsewhere, they'll, they'll not have a place to learn. So I'm urging uh, every parent to make sure that uh, you're very close to your school where your child is, so that you also know what's, what are the challenges in that school, and we can assist by maybe talking to these partners, to you, you, these donors, and uh, our schools will be, will, be, will be fair enough, because this challenge actually is not an educational problem, but it is a health issue. Professor Nyega, I'd like you to speak on this as an education policy expert and also someone who really advises on issues to do with the basic education. But I'd like to tie that in with a comment I've seen on um, Twitter. Uh, let's quickly just take a look at um, what Nahashon uh, says. He says, how can these nice policy statements translate into nice and timely resources for the deprived and COVID-19 battered schools, both public and private, to serve the learners streaming back to these institutions. How can these nice policy statements translate into nice and timely resources for the deprived and COVID-19 battered schools? Professor Inyega, for you. I think that is the constant challenge we have to deal with, really. I do not know that there is an easy answer to that question. But we have to start somewhere because uh, the ministry has already put in place plans for the children to come back to school. They have recalled the principals to come back to school. They have recalled the teachers to come back to school. They have laid everything to the best of their ability. We need to pick up our pieces from where we left off. As the minister rightly said, the CS said, 
that, you know, in terms of the curriculum, will have to begin from where they left off. So we have to begin somewhere. I know it's not going to be easy. Yes, everything usually looks very nice on paper in terms of theory. When it comes to practice, that is where the challenge begins. As uh, my colleague Mayo has said, really we need to work very closely with schools as parents, working with the teachers and the principals to ensure that uh, the, there is infrastructure within the school. The government will provide the funding, and uh, Honorable Milemba rightly say they have money. They'll def definitely, and it has already been sent to school, some bits of it, 20%, uh, there's 10% remaining. I know we need to keep going as a, as a country so that we, we sense there's movement. I know there will be challenges in terms of even the teachers, how they handle the students. That is where now the Teacher Service Commission and Ministry of Education need to come together to even work with teachers in terms of building their capacity as well to be able to look at this curriculum anew because it seems to me we are going to compress the time, we are going to be able to cover a lot of ground within a shorter time. Teachers need to actually innovate in terms of what is going to be happening in the classroom. They need all the support that they can get from the Ministry of Education, from um, even the parents, so that they are able to do a good job. Secondly, in terms of psychosocial support, the principals, the teachers, and the children need psychosocial support. We cannot just assume they are OK. There's still fear amongst the people who are coming to school, the children. They are not sure whether they're going to be safe. The teachers are not sure they're going to be safe. So we need a lot of psychosocial support provided to the teachers and the children within the school so that we also seem, uh, seem to be moving together. So I know from policy, we have laid out the infrastructure, everything is, in, is looking good. But in practice, there's more that will need to be done. The question that the schools are battered, remember even before COVID, the schools were not at the same place. We found that some schools were better endowed than others. The disparities are likely to continue. They're actually worsening because of COVID-19. Many parents have been laid off. Um, so even when we say the parents are going to support schools, as Mayo has said, some of them don't even have the resources to even buy the simple masks for 100 shillings, you know, the reusable ones. So I know it's an ever-present challenge. The government, we expect it to step up to the challenge and do its part. And while the teachers are in the school, they also do their part. They encourage the children. They also encourage each other. So we have to have systems in place within schools to ensure that we are moving forward with, with whatever resources we have at hand. Mm -hmm. We have to really move forward. OK. All right. And uh, before we take a break, I'd um, want to take a look at something else I've seen on our Twitter handles just now um, for you to be able to address that before we go on a short break. I don't know if we have that tweet or we should wait for. OK, we'll be getting it in a short while. Um, so, so Liot Michael says, our children sleep in the same dormitory for eight hours without masks. We should open schools the Magufuli way. And uh, there's another one. I think uh, we will be seeing it a bit later. Um, but when we talk about boarding schools, uh, Professor Inyega, uh, we, we, it's likely that we need to be a little bit more careful with these boarding schools. Uh, the government has asked parents who can have their children go on day schools do so. Uh, but even be that as it may, how should we then behave with boarding schools and um, with you know restricted funding, so uh, so to speak, in terms of how we handle it. It's actually very tricky. As I said earlier, I don't envy anyone running schools. But that said, I'm sure we that we need to think creatively again and innovate in terms of the resources they have within schools. My colleagues have said earlier that they could use dining halls maybe the labs, maybe put some makeshift tents within the school compound. 
to be able to manage the number of uh, the children. And now somebody has mentioned about being able to use the dormitories. And uh, you know, we know with the 100% transition, there was already overcrowding in the, in the dormitories with triple deckers. So if the children were, all the children were to come, it will even be more challenging. Now it's not going to be as challenging because we only have class four in the primary schools and class eight. And in, in high school, we only have form four. But picture a scenario where all the children have come back to school it's not going to be easy. And for me, even from a health perspective, wearing a mask for eight hours and then at night you are, you are not wearing, the, the risks are actually there. Whether you're wearing the mask, breathing within the mask for eight hours is something not healthy. And at the same time, if you're in the dormitory and you're not using the mask, the, it risks, the, 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 the risk actually becomes higher. So these are teething challenges that do not have easy answers. And we cannot pretend that we, we have begun to solve them. But as I said earlier, we need to start somewhere. Schools need to start where they are, with the resources they have. And then as time goes by, hopefully things will improve. I was just saying earlier that uh, in terms of COVID-19, it does have challenges, but it's, it's an opportunity to right some of the wrongs that we had in our education system. For example, the issue of not having appropriate infrastructure within the schools. I wish now we will take advantage of the situation and actually put in place measures both at government level and at you know BOM level, school committee level, to be able to think differently about how schooling is organized, even in terms of the curriculum, how should the curriculum be organized so that in the event that we have a, a, a calamity or an emergency like the one we had, learning can go on. All right. What alternative learning resources can we use so okay. i think there's a lot that we can do within the school what alternative learning resources can we use Thank we'll you. be getting back to that let's take a look at what our audience are saying as usual i keep saying this is their show too so let's see uh, what are some of their comments and questions um major Buni says what plan does the government have for these special schools as far as the covid19 is concerned disability is a challenge here and parents won't and can't support again is there special funding for these schools, Mr. Mboko, because you're in constant consultation with the government? I think um, you might help us shed more light on this. Let's take a look at uh, another comment. Steve Ogat, Steve Ogat says, what if COVID-19 surges in schools? How will you explain this? I think any of our panelists can pick this. And uh, even as we've seen in other countries where schools were opened, but they were forced to shut back again. So what plan do we have for this? And finally, Shadrach Mbithi says, um, Shadrach, please ask Mr. Milemba about the fate of diploma secondary teachers who are teaching in high schools about stagnation at job group K and TSC not recognizing their degree certificate. Mr. Milemba, I hope you were able to get that question. I'd like us to take a quick break. When we get back, we see some of your views. But even as uh, we continue to critique how the government has gone about this, what solutions are there um, to you know, seal some of these gaps and systemic failures in the education sector that have been there for years and now being compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic? Stay with us. You're watching The Front Row. is KTN News. Tazamaji unapohitaji kuleta mabadiliko katika jamii, tafuta elimu. Elimu itakupa fursa ya kupanda na kukwea juu na kupata suluhu na kuteremka chini ili kumpa mwananchi yule wa kawaida suluhu kuhusiana na masuala mbalimbali mbali katika jamii. Na ndiyo mambo tunazungumzia katika daula elimu kila jumapili katika KTN News na mimalimu Franco Tieno. Understanding the markets has never been this easy courtesy of the trading bell show. 
Every week we host market experts, research analysts dedicated to help you uh, navigate through this entire market and every instrument being traded. When to buy, when to sell and make some money. The idea would be to buy on dip. Mm -hmm. If something you're already holding okay. dips, uh, you'd rather just buy more and wait. When there is not much movement when it comes to the prices and the volumes, yeah. definitely will not see a, any significant movement on the indices. The market has generally been flat. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at it month to month, mm -hmm. we haven't seen much movement on the on the blue chips which is your nsc20 on top of that we cap it up with markets 101 a segment dedicated to help you understand all the jargon and the complexities in the market and then we cap it all up with answering your questions that you sent to us my name is harun madena from Kilifi County. We would like to know what is dividend drought. So make a date with us every Wednesday at 8 p.m. on the Trading Bell Show, KTN News. feedback and welcome any comments, queries or complaints regarding our news content. You can get in touch with us on SMS 22155, call 0719-012-450 or you can send us a letter on Post Office Box 30080-00100 or deliver it to our offices at Standard Group Center, Mombasa Road, Nairobi. This is KTN News. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching The Front Row. Thank you for staying with us and engaging with us in this conversation on the education sector, the phased reopening and the implementation of guidelines, uh, the COVID-19 guidelines. Rather, before we went on a break, we took a look at some of the questions and comments from our viewers on our social media pages. Mr. Mboko Milemba, a number of questions were directed to you. Um, one of them, and I'd like you to start with that, on what are the plans uh, for uh, schools um, that host children living with disability. Um, you are always, and uh, COPES is always in consultation with the government. Perhaps you can shed more light for us on this. Uh, thank you. I think uh, there were two, but let me begin with that one. Yes. The schools that uh, are special schools, and therefore they have uh, learners and students with disability of all uh, different types must be given special attention. And uh, the government in funding the schools must give special funds to these ones. Because one, they require uh, certain requirements beyond the normal ones. This may include and not limited to transparent face masks uh, with, uh, for communication, and also uh, gadgets that will allow them to, to move and remember, for them, the classes, they need more social space because of the nature of how their classes are. So for me, without uh, much ado, is that uh, the Minister of Education, and I think as uh, Parliament and any other player can petition Parliament and the Ministry to have a special funding for the special schools because of the nature of what they are. Number two is the question of the job, the teachers in job group uh, K, mainly the diploma teachers. This is actually a very serious issue, Akisa, because these are teachers who formally began uh, and were employed in uh, job group J, and then after three years they moved to K, and after six years they moved to L. But after uh, the current situation is such that they, have, they are employed in C1, which was formerly J, move to C2, which is K, and then they stagnate there. There's no clear path on how they will progress forward in terms of promotion. So this is a very seriously disadvantaged lot, 
And we are also aware that when it comes to their employment, they are again disadvantaged because they compete together with those who have degrees, certificates, and therefore they are already beginning at a lower level in terms of masks. Max, so they can not actually compete with these ones. Furthermore, uh, these teachers are uh, further disadvantaged because they are actually not having a clear way and path of promotion. And therefore, as a union, we met the representatives, we have uh, uh, gathered the information, and today, when we were having our board meeting, because it's Tuesday as a union, we have asked the Secretary General, who has already written to the Teacher Service Commission, for a meeting to discuss specifically the issue of the diploma teachers. So we are working on it, and we want to ask them to be patient. In the next two weeks, mm -hmm. we should be releasing a statement towards that. Thank I, you. I'll, I'll just, I'll just questions. slightly take you back to the first question that you've answered on the funding of special schools and um, whether this is happening. You speak about uh, petitioning, um, you know, uh, the government to increase funding to the schools. You're not just a chairperson of CUPET, you're also a member of parliament. You sit in various committees. Are we likely to see um, this happen from your end as a member of parliament? Thank you. I'll take it up, and I've done this before. It's me who petitioned the government to pay the BOM teachers, what, though they have not all been paid during the COVID period. It's in the hard side and it's on record. I'm also the one who petitioned the government to deal with the TVET teachers uh, in terms of uh, having missed their phase three and phase four of the salary increments. Currently, I'm working on a bill that will actually create a TVETA as a single employ employer of the trainers in Kenya. So I want to assure the country and the teachers that I'll be petitioning this beginning from tomorrow. Thank you, Akisa. All right. Well, um, among the latest news on this, and um, this I'll take it back to you, Mr. Mayo, um, is uh, that uh, there will be assessment of grade four and class eight students starting next week on Monday. I don't know how parents are taking this. Yeah, we welcome that assessment, uh, Madam Mandera, because our children have stayed over seven months at home. So we want to know where, where the position is. Some of them had uh, online learning, others uh, through radio. We had EDUCAN, we had KICD programs. Now that they are in school face to face with the teacher, we want that assessment. So I, I'm thanking um, Madam Garogo by issuing that uh, our children will be assessed from 19th to 23rd uh, we welcome that as parents because we want to know uh, how our children will fare. Because normally, when schools close for all holiday, the f when, they, when they come and do exams in the first week, if you compare the first exam in the first week and the second exam, they do fairly well in the second exam than the, the first exam. So I think even academically now, our children are a bit down because of the uh, of the pandemic. Yes. As 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 a, a chairperson of the parents' association, are you worried about the likelihood of a second wave or um, the rise in the number of reinfections? Um, as parent association, we are we are studying so much um, various behaviors of the virus. We are receiving information. We are very keen to know if there's any new development on the virus, because what's, what's, what's a concern most as a parent is the safety of our, ch of our children. So um, we are happy that uh, we were told by UNICEF the other day that there is a new behavior of the virus, that between the ages of 1 to 19, it doesn't affect them much as compared somebody who is 19 plus. Um, in a month, for example, we heard that uh, between the ages of 1 to 19 years, it can affect between 1 to 5 children in a month. In a month, for example, between 19 and 35, it can affect as many as 500 or even more. So that is a, a positive um, gesture for us as parents. So the more we know of the behavior of the virus, the more we can now know how to handle it. 
And that is why we are saying, I'm asking all my fellow parents to, to release the children to go, to go back to school because of the new, especially for the new behavior of the virus, and of course uh, the medication measures that have been put in place by the government and by the, the various institutions. All right, thank you. Let's go to um, uh, Professor Inyega. A number of things have been addressed here. I'd also like you to speak on uh, a possibility of a second wave. We've seen it happen in the other countries. Um, mm -hmm. As an advisor on uh, basic education and a policy expert, how should we prepare for this or a likelihood of this? I think as my colleague Mayo has said, we just need to be on the lookout to monitor the situation within the schools so that, the, for example, the temperatures are being taken every day of the children in the schools and watching out for any signs of an outbreak or a, a surge in the, in the uh, COVID-19, in which case we might actually be required to close school if it has been done in other countries like the US, the UK, Spain, Italy, you know, they reopen and quickly had to retreat. We will not have fear, I think, to retreat if the risks are life-threatening to our children and the teachers who are teaching them actually. So on that front, I think very close monitoring of the happenings within the school, the health outcomes of the children in the school and the parents or any other people involved in handling the children will be utmost. But I'm saying that with the full knowledge that some schools don't have thermal guns, some schools don't have any facility or any running, uh, maybe isolation center. But that has been the judgment call that every school should have an isolation center to manage the cases. If they can't get an isolation center, like you rightly said earlier, they work very closely with the health facility nearby. They are also perhaps overstretched. So those are just some of the things they could look into to ensure that there is no risk of our children being affected negatively. God forbid we don't want to lose any lives, that our children can be safe throughout. And secondly, in terms of assessment, I know Mayo already addressed that. Remember the children have been out for about seven months. Undertaking an assignment is important, assessment. The assessment is important to determine any learning loss. And that will inform actually where the teachers begin. How far back have the children regressed? We know very well that when the children go away for third term, they usually regress. And third term is usually two months. This one was three times and more of being away from school. So we expect that the children have regressed, but how far back do we need to go in terms of the education intervention for the children? So the assessment for the fourth graders, the eighth graders, and form four is critical for us to be able to know that so that the corrective measures can be targeted in that regard. And well, I would like to also comment about the third issue of uh, the teacher motivation, that the TSC really needs to put together a pathway right. for teacher promotion. If there's any time teachers needed motivation, this is the time. Okay. So if there's any promotion they need to have, that would really be uh, lovely and in their favor. Thank you very so much. So in your closing remarks, how do we move forward? How do we seal some of these gaps? We don't have too much time, so perhaps we keep it short. Mm -hmm. So my, my take is that uh, it's, it's going to be a work in progress. The ministry definitely has to do their part in making sure that the schools are up and running and the teachers are thoroughly prepared in terms of handling the content and also in terms of the social, psychosocial support that goes to them. And then in terms of the measures being taken within the school, I'm not sure the idea of fumigating the children will work. Let them follow the protocol of washing hands, wearing the mask appropriately, observing social distance to the best of their ability. I think if we just do the simple basic protocol that were given to us by MOH, 
we should be able to proceed well and go on to normalcy with time. Let's keep the hope up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayo. What would be your take home and as a parents association, what are you keen on um, seeing going forward? Um, actually, I'm keen on success. And for us to succeed, we must pull together the parents, the teachers, the institutions, the ministry, the government. And secondly, I would also encourage um, parents that we should have our children in day school. Because if you are nearer to a school and your child can, can go to school and come back home, I think uh, that is the way to go for now in the pandemic. And uh, thirdly, I want all the teachers to be trained on the guidelines. Because we were surprised when we saw our daughters was being fumigated in one of the schools in the social media. So I think, um, as Professor said, we want teachers to be taken through the guidelines, to have them trained, and uh, they will they'll, they'll, they'll deliver. Um, and they will follow the right protocols that is needed by, by the Minister of Health. Otherwise, on the issue of a mask, I think by next week we will have known, because we, we really want our reusable, uh, reusable masks to be used by our children because it is very expensive for us um, to fail the children the disposable mask. And finally, I would say uh, for those parents who had paid school fees for the whole year, you did not worry because we are still in 2020. For those who have not paid second term fees, maybe because we are, we are saying Corona has eaten fees. Let's uh, request the government to give us a grace period of one month so that everybody can clear. Because the school cannot succeed with all these issues if we don't pay school fees. As your chair, let me tell you, for, for your child to be, to be fed in school, for your child to have a good sleep, for that, that watchman, security man must be paid. That cook who cooks for your child must be paid. So I imagine all the parents, please, let us do our obligation. And uh, All right. for the teachers, please keep, keep our children safe in school. Thank All you right. so much. Uh, thank you very much. I'll end with you, Mr. Milemba, with your closing remarks. Um, uh, we've said it here that uh, in schools, the teachers are the frontline workers. And, um, of course, uh, them being ready and prepared and well-equipped will be very important. Are you seeing this happening? Oh, yes, it's true that uh, teachers now are the front uh, line workers. And remember, the front line workers will keep on shifting. At one time, uh, we were taking care of uh, the informal sectors, SMEs, uh, the old people, and uh, those uh, living in the informal uh, settlements. We also have had the health workers. Now it's the school and the teachers. And therefore, for me, what is required is the government to now shift funding all the priority funding to the education sector so that we support education in all forms. Uh, and that is for the minister. For the Teacher Service Commission, now teachers, your teachers are frontline workers and you must motivate them. Deal with the diploma teachers in terms of promotions. Deal with the teachers who are actually working as a senior masters in schools. Promote them because most of them are working uh, while they are in job group L and therefore they are not actually getting what they should get. This is the time to promote the teachers. And also going to the issue of uh, should we have a surge again, I would want to say this, that we are all determined to fight as soldiers in the education sector now that the ball is in our court. Mm -hmm. And we are not masters. We are calling upon every Kenyan all parents, all other stakeholders to support the education sector right. as we battle with education amid COVID. All right, thank, thank you. you. And thank I you very much. I thank say. you very much for joining us. And I'd like to wrap it up at that. Uh, quite a fruitful conversation we've had. Uh, Honorable Mboka, Mboka Milemba, Chairperson, the Kenya Union of Post Education Teachers, as well as a Member of Parliament from Higher.
Nicholas Mayo, chairperson of the Kenya Parents Association, and Professor Helen Inyega, education policy expert. I'd like to end with a tweet from one of our viewers here. Leza Sami says, parents working with schools is a challenge courtesy of some heads. A school in Western Lugango Primary receives our children, but with no hand wash station, no temperature check, and worse off washrooms in a pathetic state. But the head teacher is deaf and blind to this. I'd urge um, our uh, viewers and, of course, leadership, Mr. Mboko Milemba and Nicholas Mayo, please follow up on this and uh, some of the schools that have complaints. It's a story we'll continue to keep our eyes on to ensure that the school community learners, teachers, and um, non-teaching staff are all safe. Thank you for joining us here on the front row and participating in this conversation. I am Akisa Wandera. Till next time on the front row.